Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Inside the Mind of a Hacker Unveiled, brought to you by our friends at Bug Crowd. Thank you so much for joining us. On this event, you'll hear how most ethical hackers are curious, committed security researchers from a broad range of backgrounds who are willing and able to join the global fight against hackers. My name is David Davis of Actual Tech Media, and I'm glad to be your host for this webinar event. Before we get started, there's just a few things that you should know about the event. Of course, we encourage your questions there in the questions pane of our audience console. So keep those questions coming throughout the event. We also have a best question prize to help encourage your questions. If there's something on your mind, go ahead and ask it because you'll be entered into the best question prize drawing, which I'll talk about more here in just a moment. But first, I want to call your attention to the Handouts tab. It's there that you'll find additional resources on today's topic, including the Bug Crowd solution. And then at the end of the webinar today, it'll be my pleasure to announce the winner of our Amazon $300 gift card door prize. If you're watching this on demand, of course, the drawing has already occurred. The prize terms and conditions can be found there in the Handouts tab. And then, as I mentioned, we also have our best question prize for a $50 Amazon gift card. Prize winners will be selected from those who asked questions and who met the Actual Tech Media prize policy, which you can find there in the Handouts tab. All right, and with that, it's now my pleasure to introduce you to today's three expert presenters. Welcome to Casey Ellis, Chief Technology Officer at Bug Crowd, Chris Nzinga, Security Researcher at Bug Crowd, and Majd Atiyad, who is also a security researcher at Bug Crowd. Casey, Chris, and Maj, it's great to have you on. Take it away. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on the Inside the Mind of a Hacker webinar uh, from Bug Crowd's Inside the Mind of a Hacker 2021 report. My name's Casey Ellis. I'm the founder, chairman, and CTO of Bug Crowd. I'm joined by Chris and Maj. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves in a moment. Uh, really looking forward to this conversation today. The Inside the Mind of, of a Hacker report is something that Bug Crowd started up around five or six years ago, um, really in response to the fact that, you know, in spite of the obvious benefit that hackers were starting to provide to the internet, even at that point in time, people didn't really know who they were, what they could do, what motivated them. There was generally this almost fear around the perception of what a, a hacker is. Um, if you jump on Google image search and type hacker in still today, you get a bunch of pictures of scary looking people wearing dark hoodies and, and masks, you know, hunched over computers doing, doing nasty things. Um, part of the intent of the report is to actually show that that's not the full story. Um, there are certainly hackers that, that do look like that, the uh, malicious attackers that were actually you know, defending, helping organizations defend themselves against. Uh, but then there's this entire population of folk that think bad but do good um, you know, like myself, that's my origin into the uh, security scene and, you know, the, the two fine gentlemen that have joined for the conversation today. So, you know, one of the things that we've seen with, with the ITMOA report is, is really an increase in the diversity and the tenacity of the crowd over the past 12 months. I think the combination of COVID and the pandemic driving a lot of digital transformation, but then also the hacker community rising to, to the increased risk and the increased need for their input to make sure that the internet stays safe. We've seen that reflected on the platform. There's a variety of other findings that we can talk through, um, you know, through this uh, through this webinar itself, but also that you can find for yourself uh, looking at the, uh, the ITMOA report inside the mind of a hacker report itself. So I encourage everyone to go off and do that when they get the chance. And without further ado, I'll let the, uh, let the panelists uh, introduce themselves. Chris, do you want to go first? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so my name is Chris. I'm an ethical hacker and part-time bug bounty hunter while I'm finishing up college. I live in the United States and um, just a general cybersecurity enthusiast. Very cool, and much. So good morning, good afternoon, good night, everyone. Uh, my name is Majd Atiyat, uh, aka The Gentleman on uh, Twitter and Bug Crowd. I'm a security consulting engineer in uh, Cisco, and I've been in bug bounty in general for like almost four to five years. A long time, So yeah. I'm a full-time uh, employee, and uh, bug bounty hunting is something that I'm doing on the weekends on whenever I get uh, the time to do so. Very cool, very cool. So there's two 
kind of different career paths to uh, different perspectives on, on all of this. Um, I guess I'll start it off and I'll, I'll throw it out to either of you to respond with how you're thinking about this. Who becomes a hacker? Like, why do you become a hacker? Why do you pick up this certain set of skills and then start to apply it uh, in order to make the internet a safer place? Yeah, definitely. Um, I can kind of start. I think that one common trend among hackers is just kind of that desire to see how things work behind the scenes mm. and just kind of that curiosity that, um, you know, using a computer, but you're kind of wondering how it works at a, at a bit lower level than, you know, face value. Like and uh, adding to Chris, yes, like uh, curiosity is always the, the main factor why why there are hackers, why they are doing this. But I believe it also comes back to the human nature in general. Like we are a human, like we always like to overcome obstacles, barriers we face. We always try to find bypasses to anything. We are, we are actually hacking in life when you are trying to get uh, something for free, when you are get, trying to get uh, the cheapest ticket from uh, for a flight. And when it comes to computers, it's uh, it, it comes from for, for, for a different perspectives and objectives. It might be only the challenge. It might be only the curiosity. It might be just for the love of it. Like I'm doing something for show off. Like uh, I found something on this website. I can do this. I can do that. So the initially it's the curiosity. It's something that uh, I believe is the best line for anyone who gets into hacking. If you are not curious enough, you, you will not do hacking. You will not have the patience to dig into web applications, into companies and find stuff. That's interesting because I, you know, when you when you look at the media portrayal of hackers, it's all very exciting. There's you know crazy looking images flying around on screen, and you know the uh, the CSI cyber um, skit always jumps to mind where two people end up jumping on the same. Uh, keyboard to deter a cyber attack, which, you know, for, for the listeners that might not know, that's not how it works at all. Um, I guess coming back to to the question around, uh, you know, why do you become an ethical hacker? As a precursor to that, you know, if you're asked, what is a hacker? What's, what's your explanation or what's your definition for that? Uh, yeah, so I guess kind of building off what was said previously, I think a hacker is just um, like you said, the media likes to portray it as someone who's always breaking the rules in a malicious way, but I think it's kind of breaking the rules in a way that can be helpful. It's, you know, mm. finding those bypasses and those circumventing the rules to uh, get computers or websites to behave in a certain way that's maybe not by design. From my end, I believe it's the same. It's good that we have currently something called ethical hacker. The media sometimes now are referring to some people as ethical hacker. A hacker by default is someone who's trying to bypass control, trying to do something bad for websites or products or something for malicious purposes. But when we started to highlight through bug bounty platforms and through the media that there are ethical hackers who, as you said, uh, have the bad uh, mentality, but for doing good, for helping the company, for securing the company from the other parties. So at the end of the day, you are doing the same as a malicious hacker, but in purpose to help the company securing themselves and to secure the users as well. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I um, thank you for that. I think it was, you know, obviously bug crowd in the early days, a lot of the tasks that we had was was convincing basically the internet that this wasn't a terrible idea in the first place because I think what Chris said was exactly right. The default perception of a hacker is, is someone who is malicious. Um, the way that I've come to talk about it at this point in time is that hacking itself is actually basically morally agnostic. It's it's a it's a skill set and it's a type of curiosity that you can use for evil, um, and that's you know why we're all gainfully employed uh, to to prevent that stuff because criminals are a thing and they do use computers to commit crime, but that same curiosity, that same skill set, that same you know ability to get things to do what they weren't necessarily designed to do and actually be in control of that because of your level of mastery and your level of understanding. Um, there's a there's a profound you know use of that for for good things for defense for calling out risk, um, even for innovation and and being able to create security products and and all those different things to be able to you know improve the safety of of the internet and its users over time. So I, I do like I mean my <clears throat> my personal story I completely agree with 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 both of you on that. I think the other side of it for me is that I've always been fascinated by criminal creativity. Um, the way that I frame it is that. You know, I've, I've always enjoyed thinking like a criminal, but never wanted to be one. So, so that idea of, of being able to innovate without rules, being able to, you know, just want to see behind the locked door, 
um, not wanting to cause harm or break laws in the process of doing that, but having that kind of drive and that curiosity uh, to find an outlet for that where I can actually do good things uh, in this context. You know, when I found out that that was actually a career path pretty much straight out of high school, it was like all my Christmases came at once at that point. <laughs> So, I mean, on that topic, you know, how did, uh, you know, Chris, did you want to talk about your journey into, into this career? Because you've got a pretty interesting pathway. Your background's not necessarily cybersecurity all the way through and, and it's, it's grown. So do you want to speak through, speak through that? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, I mean, I've always kind of had that interest in, in computers and technology. But yeah, I actually did start out by majoring in chemical engineering for a few years. Um, so that, is, that was quite different from cybersecurity. Uh, and it was kind of around 2019, I was going through a bit of a transition where I ended up switching schools and switching majors. And, um, you know, I kind of used that period of time to rediscover my passion for cybersecurity. And I kind of threw myself headfirst into it um, and began by picking up a few certifications um, then moved on to the more technical kind of hands-on certifications like the OSCP from offensive security. And mm -hmm. ultimately I kind of found that uh, my passion was for web testing and that, uh, that led me to bug bounty hunting. That's awesome. Um, when, when you're talking about what, like what did you look at other, other areas to hack or was, was, you know, web testing the one that just basically piqued your interest the most or that you found yourself to be best at? So yeah, the, uh, the uh, OSCP certification is mainly like network testing, Yep. Uh, but there is some web. And then I'd kind of say there are other areas that are out there, but were less interesting to me, such as like export development. Um, as a college student, I found web testing was kind of the easiest for me to practice and easiest for me to do without really being affiliated with a company, which would be kind of more network testing. So, yeah, you know, sure. plus bug bounty enabled me to go out and get to test on hundreds of sites. So it was a, there's a lot of opportunity for that. That's awesome. And, and Madge, what's, what's your story? Yeah. So I have also an interesting story considering I'm, I'm 35 years old now. So I've been in, in computers in general and in IT since many years. Now, if I speak about hacking on a specific, I had this I had this passion for computers, for technologies when I was a young kid before university. But I can say I started hacking and I had the passion for like uh, communications, uh, satellite receivers. This is where I started to explore technologies. I used to work a lot on encryption decryption you know we at that time you had i believe world cup uh, i i i think to 1998 2002 channels were scrambled you need to have a card to watch the channels you need to pay yep. so there was a ways where you can crack the codes for these companies and then you can stream from your own server on the internet and people start watching uh, using a satellite card you have in the computer. And that was in an early stage before even entering universities. So I entered in university and I studied computer engineering. And most of my, like after studying, I stayed for like almost four years in my career, mostly working on networks, uh, voice over IP. Uh, I didn't have anything to do with the security, mostly was administration, Linux, voice over IP, networks. And security came as something from my career. Like I didn't choose mm. to go into security. I, I felt that I got bored of this uh, normal day-to-day -day, uh, business as usual for networks, for voice over IP. And I was working in a bank. The bank had a new opportunity for, uh, for a cyber security analyst. And I said, okay, I have the experience like in generally in, in systems, in OS, in networks, in in many products so why not why to see it from the other side the security side at my time then i didn't have any knowledge about bug bounty or uh, this stuff and my only option was to going with the uh, ceh certified mm -hmm. ethical hacker because it was the only let's say popular thing yeah. at that time and the most affordable uh, certificate let's say it wasn't costly from that day i started to just like playing with the websites and also doing some normal VA scans, vulnerability assessment scans in the bank. And uh, luckily, I was on Facebook, found something that I felt it's something wrong. I looked in Google. They said there is a white hat in Facebook. I submitted a bug to Facebook. I didn't expect money or I didn't know about money. It just I felt something wrong. I've seen emails, uh, details about people. Yep. They sent me a payment and the payment comes from Facebook through Bug Crowd. This is how I got to know Bug Crowd and 
All right. Started to know that there is a bug bounty programs and there are people who are paying you money for finding them uh, security issues. And yeah, I completed in this path. Like I became more uh, focused on security products, solutions, uh, developed myself, and I'm currently a security consulting engineer. That's awesome. That's awesome. The, the part about that story that intrigues me is the fact that you <clears throat> you didn't know that you'd get paid before you submitted that issue off to Facebook. Uh, you, exactly. you, were just, you were just kind of doing your thing. You got it to them and all of a sudden some money showed up. And it's like, great, and I might do that again. <laughs> yeah, and they surprised you. Like when you get for like something like that, suddenly a $1,000 or $1,500, I guess. It was a big amount like at that time you start asking yourself, okay, like this is almost my uh, my monthly salary for some bug. Yeah, no, most definitely, most definitely. That's that's something that's been really rewarding to see. Um, yeah, really, I guess, democratizing access regardless of where people are in the world. Uh, I, I think traditionally prior to, to crowdsourcing and bug bounty, you, know, you had to live in the same suburb or city or you know, at least state. As, as the organization you were supporting, uh, you know, this ho whole idea of it being basically spread across the globe from an access standpoint. And it really, at that point, being more about merit, you know, the amount of time you can put in, uh, what your particular set of skills are and, and, and how you apply them. Um, it's good for people because it creates and opens up that, that type of opportunity that you've just described. I think it's good for the defenders as well because, you know, you've got a diverse set of people that build attack surface. You've got a diverse set of adversaries that are, you know, trying to do bad things with it. <clears throat> so, the, you know, logically, the more diversity you can have in, in the folks that are out there to see what you might have missed to stay ahead of the, uh, the bad guys, um, that seems like a logical thing. Uh, the whole because math kind of element of that is actually one of the reasons I started the company in the first place. It's like, this just makes sense. We're balancing the equation here. So why not? <laughs> That's really cool. So, so Chris, I mean, in terms of your your um, you know chemical chemical engineering, we talked a little bit about this in in, in the pre calls, but some of the things that you learned, um, you know, I mentioned that that my very brief chosen vocation before I got into IT and then became a hacker and and everything kind of went from there was actually nuclear medicine, uh, and and you were doing chemical engineering. Neither of those two things are, are that related to computers or or hacking in the sense of what we're doing today. Um, how do you see the relationship between, you know, some of the things that you learn as a chemical engineer uh, and in, you know, past lives um, with, with what you're doing today? Yeah, definitely. So I think kind of like the common element there is just um, putting in the time to learn the material and then getting the results. Of course, you know, with any engineering discipline, there's just so much to learn, so many you know, equations and stuff. And it's so broad. It's, it's definitely the same with hacking, like those core fundamentals carry over, like sitting down, putting in the time to understand different vulnerability classes, how to mm -hmm. identify them, how to exploit them. Really all it comes down to is just learning the material and then being able to put it into practice. Right, right. So discovering or, or learning as much as you can around the context that you're operating in mm -hmm. and then learning frameworks to be able to apply that knowledge. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, this field, there's always so much to learn. So if, if you enjoy learning, uh, hacking is definitely a good career for you. Yeah, there's never a dull moment, that's for sure. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, Log4j and some of the things that have happened over the past week are a demonstration of that. And there's very rarely not a new vulnerability or attack happening or a new technology to dig into. Um, yeah, on that, uh, this is this is kind of a, a curveball question, but I'm curious to hear what you both think about it. Yeah, you know, with with web, with IoT, with with mobile devices, connected cars. There's there's technologies that have kind of landed, and then required securing after they've been adopted by the, by the market. Um, oftentimes that can happen quite suddenly. Uh, you know, I've got, I've got a theory that the quicker it gets adopted, the more dramatically you realize that it needs to be secured. Generally after the fact, is there anything that's out there today that you feel is uh, you know, something that people should be looking into or at least investigating as, as the next, you know, kind of big space to be uh, helping out from a security standpoint? Uh, I think one thing we've kind of seen a rise of is like dependency confusion type attacks where you're not directly attacking the product. Um, I'd say almost this log4j is kind of that type of attack. You're attacking either yeah. a product that's involved with the product or some upstream components. I think we'll see more and more of those type attacks come in. Fully agree from, with that. from my end, I think uh, there should be some more focus on IoT, on uh, on cars as well. I mean, currently most of the cars are having uh, internet connectivity, having uh, systems, having an OS, 
also the IoT, I'm not speaking about normal IoTs. I'm seeing, let's say, manufacturers like uh, even companies uh, that are having uh, technical weapons, uh, armies, these these kinds of a system, these kinds of a sensitive systems and cars, because such things are affecting lives directly. If someone was able to control a car, he might uh, cause death for many people. It's not about just only hacking a website or something. Same goes for medical. Uh, yeah. I, I think also medical institutions in general are something that should be cared of more because this is also affecting uh, people's lives. Yeah, so really you're talking about safety critical, you know, technologies yeah. that are safety critical in their impact. Yeah, for sure. I'd, I, I would add, to, I'd fully agree with those two examples. Um, critical infrastructure in, in that sense. So, so the things that underpin really how, you know, a society or a nation runs, uh, there's definitely a lot of attention going into that over the past 12 months. Uh, and that's a really good area to skill up in because I think that attention is going to continue over time. Um, the other that, that <clears throat> I've been involved in that kind of goes to safety criticality is, is actually election security. So, so the different systems that, that power, you know, a democratic process within a country, um, democracy is hard to run as it is. Uh, you overlay computers on that and then it becomes faster, but even more difficult to run. And there's the potential for vulnerabilities in those systems as well. So those are two that um, have definitely gotten a lot of attention over the past 12 months. And I would expect that attention to continue, uh, you know, in terms of my, my two cents on the answer to that question. So on that, um, you know, how has ethical hacking changed? How have, how have you both seen ethical hacking and the role of the ethical hacker, like either in the shoes of, of someone doing it or, you know, in terms of your perception of it from, from the outside in as well? Um, how has that changed over the past 10 years? I think my experience is, uh, is pretty limited since I really only learned this was a career field in the last kind of two years. Um, mm -hmm. But just things that I've heard is that um, you know, common vulnerabilities are kind of getting harder and harder to exploit as there's more, you know, frameworks that kind of handle things like cross-A scripting or SQL injection. And so I think that does kind of open up uh, these more complex so attacks. So the, def the defenders are learning is what you're saying, which is... Yeah, it's definitely a good, a good thing. thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, you know, kind of some of those older vulnerabilities are starting to go away and, you know, you have to consider other things um, to secure your perimeter. Yeah, I guess also a lot of things changed like in the last years because before ethical hacker or hacking in general was always like uh, connected with your background, your education. He should know computers. He should uh, have some engine computer related uh, certificates or studies or but no, like we have as an example currently Chris, like a great hacker and he's a, he's a chemical engineer. I personally know two persons like are crushing it now on buggy crowd. One of them is a chef. Yeah. He's making, he, he has never studied anything related to computers, but things changed because now it became much more easier for people to become ethical hackers. There are many resources now for people to learn. And, and I can consider it now it became a job for some people yeah. during this COVID thing. Ethical hacker became a job like someone now. Okay. I can do a job. I can get money for, my skills for what I do, many stuff changed like during the years. Yeah, it's now more open for the community. Anyone can be an ethical hacker if he just put the time and passion to learn and uh, to start practicing. And he has many places to start practicing and uh, doing it. Yeah, no, definitely. That's that's fantastic. And and you, you touched on a really import, important point there, you know, Chris's story coming in from chemical engineering. We see this on, on the BugCrowd platform all the time, um, different kind of adjacent skill sets that end up either helping someone understand and learn to apply hacking more quickly. Uh, so, you know, science, engineering, physics, like those types of things, even music, um, interestingly, because when you think about that, it's very creative, but very mathematical at the same time. So when you start to take that same mindset and apply it to exploitation, it can actually fit for, for, for a lot of people. Um, but then also uh, context adjacencies. So you talked about automotive security before, much. Um, some of the best car hackers I've seen are the ones that were literally car hackers in the way that the automotive community would, would use that term, not necessarily in the way that we would. Um, so they're messing around with their car to make it do stuff that it wasn't yeah. originally meant to do. They're not doing that from a security perspective. They're doing it to, to understand how a vehicle works and, and make it better. 
Um, but then if you basically get them interested in security concepts in the process, uh, they're, they're able to actually pick that up quite quickly and start to use it. So just a, a, a tip for folks that are out there. You know, one of the questions that's just come in, I'd, I'd love to get both of your thoughts on this. Um, you know, bug, bug hunting is something that's recognized across the globe, uh, which has an undoubtedly created a large community. Do you feel this community is welcoming to newcomers? Um, you know, part of my answer to that is that there is usefulness um, and, and the ability to be successful and, and to actually build a peer group, you know, regardless of where you come from. You don't need to necessarily be elite when it comes to you know, particular types of exploits. You can bring in the context that you've got. And because of the collaborative nature of folks that are truly intrigued by security research, there's almost always a, a place to slot in. But yeah, on that on that welcoming to newcomers questions, uh, you know, what are your your thoughts on that? I definitely think that the, that the community as a whole is. Um, I know starting out, I you know I didn't really know where to go for resources, so I ended up looking to various kind of information security communities and some bug bounty communities, and there I found a great number of mentors who were you know willing to talk with me one on one and help me you know awesome. identify bugs or you know help me exploit them. So that was definitely a really great experience and I wouldn't be where I am today without that community. Yeah, I think the community of Bug Bounty is one of the best communities like publicly, to be honest, because I think people who are joining now, the new joiners are very lucky because at like four years back, five years back, it wasn't like this. You didn't have a lot of resources. You didn't have a lot of streams. A lot of mm. good people are sharing uh, tips, skills. It was like something is still hidden for some specific people and depending depending on your own skills. Now, whenever you go to Twitter itself, to Twitter itself, if you just follow the people who are doing bug bounties, you get on daily basis a new information, a new how to's, a new how to approach targets. Every day you see a new tool, a new blog, I know a new so I found this bug and I want to tell you how I found it. Before you you were like shy to share or to write a blog that I did that. Now people are sharing everything they find. Yeah. And we have Slack, we have Discord, we have Bug Crowd University, we have uh, many other resources that you can just go and choose the proper place. And yeah, it's very easy for you to go ahead. And the platforms also supporting that, like they are sh encouraging people when they are doing something, when they are sending their first report, okay, Maybe this is wrong, but you can check this video, you can check this book, you can read this document. So they are not giving them this negative energy like, okay, you cannot do this or you are not worth to do that. No, they are encouraging people to dig more and do it. Yeah, no, 100%. I, I, I fully agree with that. Um, you know, I, I joined the hacker community at a time where there was a degree of gatekeeping for want of a better word um you know exactly. being at, like having to pass the bar to, to to be accepted within the community and i think to this day there's still the perception um you know that people are able to have from the outside looking in that that's that's still true um i, I fully agree with what you're saying about it being less true now there's there's definitely you know the the hacker community just in general i've found has a has a crunchy shell but a soft center um and it's actually more you know inclusive than than it might appear to folk uh, on, on, on first pass. Because you think about what we're doing, we're all trying to break stuff. We're all trying to you know, figure out where things have gone wrong in order to be able to make them safer. Um, so there's a certain worldview that if you're not familiar with it, it can look like it's constantly kind of cranky at the world or, or a bit hostile or whatever else. It's actually not like that is, is, is really what I've found. Um, and what we've tried to do within Bug Crowd is to, is to basically almost counter that, that um, you know, concern that people have uh, coming in. It's like, well, I thought hackers wouldn't accept me unless I'm really good. It's like, no, like we all started terrible. Um, that's that's where you start. So, you know, there's there's no exception really to to that part of the learning process and and giving people the opportunity to insert themselves wherever they're at. Um, that's something that we've definitely prioritized. And and to your point, seen a lot of other people prioritize along those same lines, which is which is a fantastic thing. I think that other piece around collaboration is really important as well. Um, so a couple of the other questions, and, and for folks that are that are on the webinar, uh, there is a, a Q and A box. Um, there are a steady stream of questions coming in. I've I've got more of my own, but I would actually prefer to be able to pick from the ones that y'all are sending in. 
because uh, that's the stuff that you're wanting to talk about and that we've got the ability to answer within within this chat. So feel free to use that. Feel encouraged to use that. Um, so one question here, I have experience in IT for more than six years, but in the hacking field, I'm new. Where do I start? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think also kind of one of the best things um, about hacking changing is that I've seen in the last year or two, like so many new resources popping up. Yeah. Um, there's just so many great free resources out there now to learn. I think number one that comes to mind if you're interested in web hacking is uh, Port Swigger's Web Academy. They have like lots of free labs um, that let you kind of practice different bug classes and teach you about that. So that's kind of the number one spot that comes to my mind for learning web application hacking. I I would go with Ben Testerland and with uh, e-learn security because I believe the question is not dedicated also only about bug bounty. If you want to go also in the penetration testing field itself, mm. it's much more than uh, web applications. Yes, I think like Port Swigger for web security is one of the best. And for certifications, I've been there, done that. I don't think most of the certificates give you the knowledge that is already publicly available on these platforms. There are many stuff that are public. I don't think you need certificates. There are some challenging uh, certificates from offensive security like OSCP, OSWE. But this is for, I, I guess it's for a career wise, like to develop in your career to get a proper uh, job. But when it comes to bug bounty and ethical hacking, yeah, the, the, the non-public resources are there to help you. And also uh, the platforms itself are providing you some trainings. I mean, for background, there's background university. For yeah. Hacker One, they have some also videos and yeah. tutorials. So, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of knowledge around. And, and th those were some good pointers around where to look. Um, it, it is one of those things. That, you know, what I would add to that is that there's a, a variety of discords and slacks and different things, the, uh, the various DEF CON groups. Um, if you've got a particular area of interest, there's an automotive village, an aerospace village, an AI village, there's web hacking, recon, all of these different kind of facets of, of, of hacking and, and, and cybersecurity. Um, you know, one of the things that I always encourage people to do if they're first joining is to taste test as many things as they possibly can. Because um, from my perspective, you know, the best things happen when you connect your interest to the thing that's going to hold your interest and actually draw you into it. Uh, Security is an incredibly broad field. It's not just web hacking or defense or malware. It's all of these things and they all kind of relate to each other. So finding out which aspect of the field is the one that, that is the best fit with, with how you think and, and what motivates you and, and really what gets you out of bed and gets you excited in the mornings. Um, I think that, uh, that journey is a really important one for people to take, especially at the outset. I actually think it's a good idea for people to actually go back and revisit that every now and then as well um, because... Yeah, that's a decent way to combat some of the fatigue that can come in. Uh, you know, for folks that have been hunting in a particular way for a long time, sometimes you need a context switch. So there is that option to go out and look at other things and, and see, you know, if you want to double down on what you're already doing or to start to investigate something new and add to your skill set. Um, so question that came in, a degree or skills, uh, a degree or skills, certifications included, which is the most important thing in ethical, ethical hacking or pen testing? So is it the paper that you've got to prove to other people that you can do a thing or is it just doing the thing? Yeah, so I think this kind of relates to what Maj said about if you're looking for a career or if you're just looking to kind of, you know, do some hacking on the side or bug bounty yeah, or anything. I think um, career-wise, there still is kind of that, stigma where a degree is required and some professional certifications but I do think it's kind of shifting more towards you know can you do the skill you know can you do an entrance exam or something and pass a technical assessment uh, so it's more and more it's approaching the just having the skills is, is good hmm. Maj you got anything to add to that yeah I think it's more of a skill set like as I mentioned earlier certificates are just for only for career and actually currently like if you're a good bug bounty hunter and you have a profile a good profile on a platform this is actually helping you to get a, a job if you want a career. Now, companies do not like look a lot now about degrees, about they look about your experience, they test you. They ask you mm -hmm. if you are able to, uh, to answer these questions in a proper way. That means you have the skill set. I don't need to look on a certificate you had. Maybe you had, I mean, most of these certificates have the answers are available online. Anyone can take a certificate and put it and say, I'm, I'm a cybersecurity expert. I'm, mm -hmm consultant but on the ground when it comes to work when it comes to do something 
this is where you can differentiate between people based on a skill only. Yeah, no, 100%. Um, I, I would add to that that uh, you know, certain co- like costs more as an employer to take time to understand someone's skills. Um, it, it's, it's comparatively cheap to think about it through the lens of a hiring manager to go through a bunch of resumes and look for the ones that have degrees versus the ones that don't have degrees. Um, it's unfortunate, but it's, it's a function of, of needing to look through a ton of candidates to be able to hire someone within an organization. So, you know, both are important. Um, I, I agree with what Chris said, uh, that skills are, are actually increasing in, in the balance of, of importance as, as time goes by, um, partly because, you know, whatever you learn in university or in college or, or even in a certificate, um, the likelihood of that actually expiring and becoming out of date knowledge um, quickly, given how fast this field moves is, is quite high. So I think uh, employers are starting to recognize that fact and look for practical demonstration of skill and, and more how people think than what they've proven they've been able to you know, get right in the test previously. Um, but that's something to consider. Like if you if you're going, if your aspiration is to go for a job in a larger organization, then understanding you know what you might need to do or to have under your belt to to make it as easy as possible, and, you know, to increase your chances as much as possible. I guess is what I'm saying. Um, that's 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 a wise thing to do. Um, my and personal also- bias, my personal bias is you know if you can demonstrate the skill to the point where that skill becomes obvious, then it doesn't really matter what paper you've got, but that doesn't always necessarily work depending on what you want to get done. And, and that doesn't mean that you don't have to take trainings. I mean, it depends yeah. on your objective as well. Like yeah. if your objective is just doing bug bounty and getting money for like a specific bugs you learned, it's okay. But if you want to be master, let's say in mobile applications and mm-hmm. exploit development and source code, yeah, you obviously need a proper training from someone who has experience to give you that knowledge. Definitely, definitely. I actually think just on that one really quickly, because it's very easy to start a religious war on, on, on this particular question. Everyone's got their own point of view. It's generally informed by their own experience and what's worked for them. Like I'd, I'd never finished a degree. Um, so I'm going to have a bias towards the fact that those aren't necessary. That's not actually what I believe. I do think they're important uh, for some people in certain contexts. I think the bigger thing is really understanding what's best for you in terms of how you learn. Um, You know, some folk, one of the reasons I didn't finish my degree is because that's just not how I learned. The idea of being locked into, you know, following coursework for that period of time for the sake of getting a certificate at the end of it. For me, that's not really compatible with with my style of learning. Um, And that's not to say that that's right. That's just something that I learned about myself uh, and then, you know, basically took that and proceeded to create other pathways. And so far, it's worked out quite well. So, you know, understanding, taking some time to understand what the best pathways are for yourself, getting feedback from your friends. This is where I think community comes into it um, because, you know, the more relationships you develop, the more you can see how other people learn and actually get feedback from them around what might be more effective for you. All of those things together, I think, can actually help, you know, distill that path for, for, for people that are asking this kind of question. So here's a, here's a fun one, uh, maybe a bit down on the personal level, and don't worry, it's not too personal a question. Um, what type of music do you jam out to while hunting bugs? The fun one. Very important too. Yeah, definitely an important question. Um, <laughs> for me, it's almost kind of like the same music you'd want to like work out to. So maybe more yeah. like electronic music, something with a beat, uh, something that keeps you going and keeps you you're energized while you're hacking. Yeah, I guess it might be the similar, but I'm mostly like when I'm doing hacking, I, I listen to all kinds of music during the day. But when it comes to hacking, I just in hip hop and rap, I believe this is gives you power. You feel powerful when you are listening to these old schools, Tupac, Snoop Dogg, the, these these kinds of music. It just makes you working uh, in an energetic way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuff that makes you feel invincible, right? Yeah. That kind of, you know, motivation. Uh, yeah, I, I completely agree with that. I'll do the same sort of thing. Um, the exception will be if I'm trying to kind of calm down, frankly, and, and, and go back through a bunch of stuff to, to pull, you know, if it's, if it's direct, like exploitative work, um, that's when the motivating and the, like the run through the wall type music uh, will be my go-to. Um, if it's, okay, sit back and go back through a bunch of data to try to infer different things then I'll, I'll i'll maybe you know put the chill out tunes on or, or do something like that 
also probably if I need to go to bed and you know, it's too late because I've been distracted by something, <laughs> which is something that we all experience in this space, I'm sure. Um, so here's a, here's a really uh, actually important and I think, um, yeah, just I'll get to the question. I, it, to me, this one's actually pretty important. So as someone who's starting with bug bounties or vulnerability research, I'm sometimes wondering what if the target might think that I want to do harm? Uh, yeah. How do you how do you both navigate that? Um, you know, and and indeed, how have you seen that maybe change in terms of um, you know what it looked like five years ago versus today? Yeah, so I think starting out, I kind of had this fear too that right, like I didn't want yeah. a bunch of malicious malicious traffic coming from you know my home and um, anyone being worried about it. So I know something people do is have use like a VPN to avoid getting blocked by a you know, web application firewall. But I know. I think uh, what a lot of mature programs are doing is have you set like a user agent or a certain header that allows you to kind of differentiate your traffic from, from what be, might be like a malicious traffic. So I think that's a really good idea. And the programs that do that, it's definitely uh, reassuring to know that they know you're working with bug crowd and you are, you know, doing good. Mm. I think the look became different before, before uh, bug bounty platforms, it was difficult. Like when you are sending an email to a company, I find a bug, they, the reaction or the response will not be good. They will think that you are doing something bad, mm. that you are using them. They will start mm. to tell you, okay, we will call the lawyers. We will do this, we'll do that. Because this is normal. Like they, they don't have trust. They don't know you. The platforms came and solved that. The platform became a bridge between these ethical hackers and, uh, and uh, the programs. There is a safe harbor. There is a policy. There is a scope. There is a rules of engagement. So... Mm. And the program have the power. If a user misuse, I can just immediately remove you from the platform. And there is there is a trust now with the platforms. Before it was missing. It just a random email, something name, numbers at Yahoo, at Gmail, at you all sending you. You have an SQL injection. You have an RCE, and and the 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 idea of getting money wasn't there as well. It will be yeah. Yeah, the sense of the sense of value uh, around that. I mean, I, I think it is important, um, you know, in terms of I'm concerned about whether or not it's going to be perceived um, as malicious. What I'm about to do to try to help. This is where really focusing on organizations that have actually published a, a bug bounty or a, a vulnerability disclosure policy is is an important first step. Um, it is you can do vulnerability research after that outside of that, and if you discover something outside of that, then you know, there's going to be the desire or the need to let people know. Um, but the important thing to remember is that if, if organizations haven't been proactive around taking that step and actually publishing it, yeah, you know, really what you are doing is, is reaching out to them and calling their baby ugly at that point in time. And if you're on the inside of that organization, you weren't expecting that, maybe it's the first time that's happened, you can understand why that's an inherently hostile, potentially an uncomfortable uh, exchange. It's not because you're doing it wrong um, or necessarily even that they're doing it wrong. It's just a confronting thing to go through on the, on the receiving end. Like I help people with that. I get phone calls all the time from folks that feel like they're being extorted um, or, or shaken down by, you know, bad hackers from, <clears throat> from other parts of the world. And it turns out to be someone who's just trying to get to the right person so they can let them know there's a thing that they need to fix. Uh, that's still something that happens today. Uh, so you know, the way to basically get around that risk as a hunter is to, as I said, look for programs that are actually proactively going out there and saying, yes, this is okay. Um, the other thing I would say around this is that, uh, you know, the the evolution of safe harbor, the evolution of, of like carve outs and pressure on anti-hacking legislation to basically account for the fact that people can do this for good reasons as well as bad ones. You know, the, the important bit of history there is that <clears throat> most of the rules around hacking that prevent it were written in a time before we were known. <laughs> so, you know, if you're hacking a computer, you're automatically a bad person because why else would you do that? That's when most of the laws around this type of thing were, were actually created. So there's some updates that are needed there. Um, but there has been a lot of progress on, on, on that front. I think the idea of making sure it's legally safe for everyone involved is higher on the priority list for people running programs. And then you see, you know, programs like or, or initiatives like the uh, the Binding Operational Directive out of CISA, DHS here in the US, where they're basically going out and forcing all of the different agencies to run 
a vulnerability disclosure program, that sends a pretty powerful signal to everyone else that, yeah, this is okay. Um, not only do you need this help, this help is actually a good thing. It's not a bad thing. And while it, you know, you might take some time to get your head around the difference between a good hacker and a criminal on the receiving end, um, that is a thing that you need to start thinking about. So I do feel like it's heading in the right direction, uh, but there's still quite a bit of work to do on, on that particular one. I think I felt it like, like the, I was 100% felt like, okay, now bug bounty became a thing. Now it's in the good direction. The moment I've seen banks doing bug bounty programs That's and right. airlines, yeah. Yeah. because th those specific categories, banks and airlines were like very sensitive. People used to like find an access us and going and put uh, a screenshot on LinkedIn. People will start threatening. We will call your, it, 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 it takes you directly to prison actually when you are dealing with banks and airlines, but you are seeing now many banks are encouraging people on bug bounty programs to find bugs and airlines, even though it's a very critical organizations. And here you see, okay, now we are in a good direction. Now these people are trusting these security researchers and ethical hackers to help them other than these other companies who are doing a quarterly or monthly penetration test for, for a specific payment. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that, that was that was one of the reasons I started the company in the first place. It was two things. One was to connect the latent potential of the white hat community with this problem of cybersecurity and allow that playing field to be balanced out against the skills of the adversary. The other was, frankly, to keep my buddies out of jail. Um, you know, this perception of, of people trying to do the right thing or even just being curious uh, are inherently malicious and, and the chilling effect that that created in, in the hacker community at that point in time, uh, it was definitely something that I and I know a lot of others wanted to try to fix. And yeah, I, again, I, you know, my point of view on that is that <clears throat> the work is far from done, um, but it's definitely moving in the right direction as, as more folk adopt and as more folk become aware of you know, the need for, for hackers to actually operate you know, really is the internet's immune system in a lot of ways. Um, if, if there's things that need to be discovered and fixed and killed off, um, and hackers are the ones that identify that. There's this really nice analogy between that and how uh, an immune system functions within the human body. I think that's kind of what we do in a lot of ways. So the more we can work with that immune system as opposed to against it, I think the better. All right, I'm digging back through these questions some more real quick. Um, what was your first bug? I think I got pretty lucky with my first one. I had a stored cross-site scripting on a public nice. program that, so I was pretty happy about that. Um, as far as bugs go, it was pretty easy to find and identify. So it was a pretty good first bug. For me, it wasn't technical at all. I was using something, a portal for Facebook where I put my email and password and looked into something inside. It's not the main Facebook, other portal for them. I pressed back or something, I removed the path, something like that, and suddenly appeared many, many emails and many details about users. So it was a purely, not technical, it's just removing a path and suddenly everything next to you. Off, off it went from there. Yeah, that's those are fun. The uh, the um, you know seeing eye doors and, and tripping over those by accident. I'm I'm always reminded of the uh, the face mash vulnerability in Apple iOS that came out. I think it was last year or the year before. It was actually discovered by a kid playing Minecraft and and FaceTiming his friends at the same time. He noticed his phone was doing something weird. Got it, got it to repeat the the weird behavior, and um, you know spent the next week with his mum trying to figure out how to contact the uh, the cert <laughs> within Apple. So it's not necessarily people going out and looking deliberately. Sometimes vulnerabilities just happen as a product of curiosity or noticing that something's acting weird. Um, my first that I remember was actually finding a, a backdoor in Apple IIe um, that allowed you to to directly manipulate the uh, the memory registers. And, and literally at the time, I didn't know what fuzzing was, but functionally I was kind of fuzzing the keyboard um, as a you know eight or nine year old and it dropped down into this system. And I'm like, okay, I'm behind the locked door now. Like most people aren't meant to be able to see this. I've actually managed to do a thing that I wasn't meant to. Like then the question became, how does this work? How do I, how do I play with memory and, and all those different things? So that's, that's one that sticks out in my mind. And completely accidental. That's that sounds like a savant story. It's not. I was just bashing the keypad, and all of a sudden something weird happened. So I repeated it. It was a little bit like the face smash vulnerability in a lot of ways. 
Um, all right, another question. What type of bug scares you the most to find during an assessment? When I say scare, I mean something so dangerous that you have to let the vendor know immediately. For me, credentials, like because I have found many of those and it's like the easiest ones, like because when I started with the GitHub thing, with the other other skills, GitHub thing, like when when just someone post post his VPN credentials or posting for his privileged account management solution credentials, like a solution that controls and saves your passwords and you put the administrator account and password for that portal and its public portal. So yeah, this is something that scares because if it goes to the wrong, wrong hands, it's a disaster. Yeah, and it's very easy to exploit too, right? Exactly. You're yeah. not having to, yeah, okay, cool. Chris, what about you? Yeah, definitely those uh, information disclosures can be pretty impactful. Um, I mean, of course, the easy answer here is any code execution, especially if it's unauthenticated. Those are always- Log4j, cough, cough. Yeah, that was definitely <laughs> a big one. Um, so, so yeah, the combination of either severe information disclosure or remote code execution are definitely the two that, that make you, you know, type that report a little bit quicker. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. I, I think that concept of impacts is, is a really important one for hunters to be constantly trying to learn from. Um, because we can't tell from the outside in fully what, uh, what impacts a technical vulnerability has on the organization. We don't know what mitigations they've got in place or, you know, on the, on the like more severe side, if we pulled a string that the entire company is attached to, and this is actually way more critical than we think it is. Um, the, I've, business, I've, I've, the business impact. Yeah. Like most people, yeah, miss that. The business impact, not the technical impact. Exactly, exactly. And face, Facebook actually used to do, um, I think they still do, do a really cool thing with that. If they uh, receive a vulnerability and in the process of, of burning that vulnerability down, they discover that it was more severe than the reporter thought it was, then they'll actually pay them based on their assessed severity, not just the reporters, which is which is pretty neat. Um, but yeah, for hunters to... to be thinking that one through like there's this theme of empathy that I keep on coming back to in this conversation uh, you know talking before around like a vulnerability coming in for the first time is a bit confronting now we're talking about you know the 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 business actually understanding risk impact in a way that you functionally can't from the outside um, constantly being aware of that and, and working on how to increase your skills and improve the way you think to to be able to you know, be more useful and, and actually be able to communicate more effectively, I think is a, is a kind of underrated soft skill for, uh, for, for hackers and for bug bounty hunters. We've talked a lot about technical expertise and different things like that, but there is this human element um, and, and a human communication element that really drives this conversation that really can't happen without it. So that's, that's not a bad thing to be working on as well. I said, so I said something related to that before and not many people accepted it. Like I'm not against, if you are a full-time bug bounty hunter, like you can be a full-time bug bounty hunter, but currently the new generation is going in that easy way. I just want to go directly to bug bounty. Right. I, I always encourage anyone and these newcomers, if you don't want to have a career, at least, at least stay for one year or six months in an internship, just, just like work in a team, see how companies from the inside react, how the incident response, how the business yeah. impact analysis is okay. happening, the solutions they have, how they are detecting things, the change management, the process, like sometimes you send a report, okay, no, they are not solving the report. Okay, but inside they have a change management, they have approvals, they have a manager, senior manager. Yep. You should you should see it from the other side. You don't you shouldn't have all if you if you if you get a good money from Bug Bounty, you don't have a career, but at least an internship, one year, two years, just understand the other side, how they work. The challenges they they face when you just write when you just write a small report, we think okay now they can solve it directly. But the fact is, a war happens on the background. Many people engage. Yeah, no, that's that's really really good advice and underrated. I think that's the kind of the kind of learning pathway that um, that is easy to miss if you if you're just focused on the tech. Um, so thank you for thank you for raising that one. Um, so we've got time for two more, uh, and and this one is actually, you know, a, kind of a twofer. Um, a question for both the panelists: How do you understand work on a web application which has a technology stack that you have no knowledge of or that's new to you? Thank you. Also for Zynga, how do you brew wine at home? Maybe you can come back to that second bit later, um, and we'll do the first one. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
So for a web application, which has technology I'm not familiar with, I mean, it sounds silly, but lots of Googling pretty much. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know, and trying things, seeing what works, just looking for that interesting behavior. Even if I haven't come across a certain technology before, there are certain common fundamentals and skills that carry over that can be, uh, that can be tried. That's awesome. Exactly. As, as Chris said, like Googling and actually any technology, it has a documentation. There is always a documentation for everything. And if it's possible or if it's free to, to test this locally, it's much more better that if you can test it locally on your machine and try to find it from a fresh view, then you can deal with it on the real life of application. Yeah, that's, <clears throat> that's awesome. So continually fostering that ability to get answers to questions that you've got doing research, Googling, like it's, I actually gave that answer in a job interview. I remember back in the day, how would you solve this particular problem? It was a technical question and I didn't know the answer. So I said, I'd take the, I'd take the error message and I'd Google it. Um, and, you know, I didn't think that would be fine because it felt like a naive or a bit of an unprofessional answer, but it was great. It was actually what they wanted to hear at that point in time, which was a shock. Um, kind of illustrates the point. It's like, yeah, you can't know everything. And, and there's always an opportunity if you know how to find those answers to actually increase your own knowledge and get the job done at the same time. All right, this has been, this has been heaps of fun. Thank you to everyone who's asked questions. Sorry for those that we, uh, that we didn't get to. It's, it's literally been lighting up this entire time. So I, I kind of went from mine across to the stuff coming in from the audience about halfway through and I've been stuck there ever since. And, and these questions have been fantastic. So we appreciate that. The last one I guess I wanted to ask both of you is, you know, we've talked a lot about how um, this scene like cybersecurity, being a hunter, being a hacker, how that's evolved to today. We've talked a fair bit about the present. What happens next? Where, where do y'all see, you know, bug bounty hunting, you know, being a hacker, being a pen tester, you know, operating in the way that you do to, uh, to help folks make things safer? Um, what does that look like in five or 10 years time even? Yeah, I think um, just in terms of bug bounty to start, I think a lot of more security conscious companies are going to start kind of adopting bug bounty programs as kind of that idea of defense in depth. You know, you'll get your annual or quarterly pen test or something, but, you know, what if something like the log4j vulnerability pops up, um, you know, and you had just had your pen test last week, like you could be vulnerable to this. And that's where having that community of, you know, kind of crowdsourced hackers looking at your assets continuously will keep you most protected. So I think hopefully we'll see more adoption of that as, you know, kind of an expected defense measure I like that yeah likewise i think like more companies will start accepting bug bounty and m maybe let's say the more uh, concerned organizations or type of folks will start accepting bug bounty and bug bounty platforms and i want to i don't want to open the debate of penetration testing this uh, this bug bounty program because i, I don't think anyone tester. knows what either of those words mean anymore yeah. so don't but worry to be that. honest to be honest like I think bug bounty is somehow like overcoming penetration testing. Penetration testing is just something happening internally, still needed internally for environment. But for the external surface, I don't think you need a company for penetration testing when you have a bug bounty and no contract, no specific time. Hackers are working on your organization and monitoring it 24 seven. They monitor it more than you actually. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. That's awesome. All right, so this is this is the actual last question. How do we how do we get in touch with with both of you? Do you have a blog? Do you have a, a, a stream or a podcast? Twitter, any of that kind of stuff? Just um, you know, for the listeners to be able to reach out and 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 stay in touch. If you could share that, uh, we'll we'll end it there. Yeah, definitely. I'm active on Twitter. Uh, my username is C and Zynga with an underscore at the end. So first initial, last name, underscore. Or you can find me on LinkedIn if you want to connect there. For me as well, I'm uh, on Twitter on uh, my account, The Gentleman. I'm also on Bug Bounty Forum on Slack. If you are in part of that group as well, I am there. Um, I don't blog a lot unless there is something uh, giving value for, for people, a new thing that they didn't read about. And enough time to write about it well, too, is the struggle I always have there. It's like, oh, no. Not going to get to that. <laughs> it's definitely a thing. Thank you so much, Chris and Madge. This has been this has been a really fun conversation. Uh, you know, I hope everyone who has joined has has gotten value from it, and the people that watch it back after the fact uh, get value from it as well. Um, as I mentioned at the top of the uh, the the conversation, download the Inside the Mind of a Hacker report from Bug Crowd. There's a whole bunch of data 
uh, and and kind of you know data based analysis of what we've seen the crowd do over the past year that that really does support a lot of the things that we've talked about today. Um, and yeah, feel free to reach out. Uh, you know, on the Hunter side, Bug Crowd University, and getting in touch with with us on our Discord and Slack and all those different things around learning and increasing your skills, signing up for the platform. And then for folks that are looking to run a program, feel free to reach out. We're obviously very happy to help. Thanks all. Thank you, Casey. Cheers. Thank you.